Okay, good, good. We are so welcome to everyone here in person and on Zoom for those that are making. I assume more people will join because it's like seven o'clock right now, but I want to get started. And we're very excited to have Rabbi Matt Berkowitz here um, in Cleveland. Rabbi Berkowitz uh, is coming from straight from Jerusalem, right? Uh, to be here this weekend uh, for the installation and to install Rabbi Hale, Rudin Luria. Um, and I know a friend from rabbinical school, or prior, I don't know, <laughs> from rabbinical school, good. Um, and I know I think this evening is mostly about your work as an art, as a Jewish artist, uh, which we're very excited uh, to see some of your work and to learn a little. Um, and I know throughout the weekend, uh, not on you can certainly see everything on Shabbat for those that are here in person as well, but also an opportunity to order uh, some wonderful works as well, uh, either now or after Shabbat. Uh, or to find online, I assume as well. <laughs> but but we're very excited to have Rabbi Berkowitz here with us, and I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you so much, Rabbi Foster. Yeah. And uh, Erev Tov, it is so wonderful to be with you virtually and also in person. I feel that I have traveled from, from one Jerusalem to another. Uh, in so many ways, I consider Ohio to be another Jerusalem, uh, and certainly a hotbed of Yiddishkeit. Um, I, find it absolutely remarkable that uh, Ohio has given birth uh, to some of the most talented leadership in the Jewish world. So I want to say, really, uh, off to all of you who live here in Ohio. And it's an honor to be here celebrating Rabbi Rudin Loria's uh, installation uh, this coming Shabbat. So with that, I want to say that I see names of everyone on Zoom. I want to be sure that I get the names of my congregation that's here in person as well. So I just want to ask you to please introduce yourself and uh, congregation that's here and tell me where home is, <laughs> however it is that you want to define home. Okay, so. <laughs> David and Margie Cohen. David and Margie. Yep, we live like. Somewhere else from here. And that's home. Yes, that's Great. home. Good answer. David and Margie. Hi, Michelle. And I live about one mile from here. <laughs> or two. Yes. David, Margie, Michelle. Eric, I grew up in this congregation when I was a child. So I have a Clevelander living in Maryland. Put it that way. Uh, we came 380 miles to be at this event today. Really Wonderful. Good. But not as far as you do. <laughs> <laughs> and and I'm and I'm sure and we travel as a set. <laughs> We're here a lot. So some people don't stay. think we live here, but we don't. Wonderful. I'm Halina and you don't have an Hebrew accent. Surprisingly, I don't have a Hebrew accent. Um uh, so you're opening the window for me to tell you a bit uh, of my story, which is that I was born in Brooklyn, New York, raised in Freehold in New Jersey, basically just down the road from where Rabbi Hal Rudin Loria grew up. I grew up in Freehold, New Jersey. Hal grew up in, in Deal, New Jersey. Um, Freehold is famous for Bruce Springsteen. And uh, a number of my teachers were also Bruce Springsteen's teachers. And I had the privilege of making Aliyah 14 years ago from um, the other Jerusalem of Boca Raton, Florida, uh, <laughs> where I lived for, um, for seven years. Um, that was the inspiration in so many ways to make Aliyah. Uh, and I can share with you that the past 14 years of my life have been an absolutely wonderful adventure. Um, I consider it the greatest privilege to be able to live my life in Israel and to be able to combine my two great passions of Jewish learning and art. And um, it's, it's that intersection of both that I wanna talk to you about tonight, the intersection of Jewish learning and art. I have been an artist since age 10. I've been painting since age 10. And for so many years of my childhood, I always considered my art to be very, very separate from my Jewish identity. And, I had a Sinai moment in college when those worlds of art and Jewish learning came together in a very, very powerful way. And there's a special Ohio connection in that moment as well. 
my senior year at Colgate University, I took a seminar on the Passover Haggadah. And at the end of that seminar, the professor showed us a slideshow. Remember classical slideshows? Yeah. Okay, oh, not, uh, not PowerPoint, but real uh, slides, right? The, Everyone in this room and probably on Zoom, right, remembers, you know, real slideshows. So we had a real slideshow on one of the most special Haggadot that has ever been created, and that is the Moss Haggadah. How many of you are familiar with the Moss Haggadah? Ah, okay, I see one hand up. Okay, it, it should be unanimous here, especially you Ohioans. Um, you should know everything there is to know about the Moss Haggadah because David Moss, who created the Moss Haggadah, is originally from Dayton, Ohio. And it is truly one of the most spectacular Haggadot that, that has ever been created. So uh, my professor at Colgate University put together a slideshow on this Haggadah and as I was watching these slides pop up on the screen, I saw the world of Jewish learning and art come together in a very, very powerful way, like I had never experienced before. And from that moment, I decided that what I was going to do going forward is to bridge those worlds of Jewish learning and art. There she goes. And then fast forward, ah, there we go. That is the yeah. cover of the Mas Haggadah that you see on the there screen there. Thank you so much for putting that up there. And so fast forward from my university years to after my ordination at the Jewish Theological Seminary, I was brought on at the Jewish Theological Seminary. I joke around that for 10 years, I was Chabad for the Jewish Theological Seminary. I had the privilege of going out to teach to individuals, couples, small groups, tailored learning experiences, in the New York area, in Florida and beyond. And the idea was to create relationships based on Torah learning that would expand people's knowledge of, of the Jewish Theological Seminary. The first study group that I taught in Boca Raton, Florida was a business ethics group. And at the end of that business ethics study group, a young guy came running up to me and asked me, what else do you teach besides business ethics? So I went down a menu of classes that I teach. And one of the, the classes that I mentioned is called the archeology span of the Passover Haggadah. And he turned to me and he said, you know, my parents own a very, very special Haggadah. So of course I asked, what is that? He said, did you ever hear of the Moss Haggadah? I said, of course. And I expected him to tell me that he has a coffee table edition of the Moss Haggadah. What does he turn around and tell me? His parents commissioned the original Moss Haggadah. And he asked me, what are you doing Thursday night? And that Thursday night, thank God, my schedule was open. This was Danny Levy. He took me over to his parents' home, Dick and B. Levy, now of blessed memory. Dick Levy pulled the original Moss Haggadah out of the vault. And there I was standing over this spectacular piece of work explaining to the couple that commissioned it, right, all about this very, very special Haggadah. And out of that, this very, very beautiful friendship between myself and David Moss grew. And David Moss became a mentor in my life. Today, David Moss is a partner in a studio project called Kola Ot. Uh, there are four of us that are partners in this studio in Jerusalem's Artist Lane. How many of you have been to the Artist Lane in Jerusalem? We have. Oh, thank God. Okay, so on your next trip to Israel, this is a must-see. Uh, 14, 14 years ago when I made Aliyah, we started this project of Kolaot, and what we do is we teach Jewish history, texts, and values through the arts. Tonight, I want to share my art with all of you uh, and give you a window first into my Haggadah. From my Haggadah, uh, we're going to move into... Uh, a set of mezuzot that I recently created, a tzedakah box, and then finally a Moroccan paper cut. Uh, so I will keep you all on your toes. Hopefully when you're here on Shabbat or Saturday night, you'll have an opportunity to see, those of you who aren't here in person now, you'll have an opportunity to see this artwork. Do you have uh, uh, slides of this? Or is this yes. So what I'm going to do is I am going to share a PowerPoint of this. 
so you could see uh, the images quite vividly in person. They will be seeing the original art in addition to the images that we have in the PowerPoint. Uh, in 2001, I was commissioned to create a new Haggadah. And this came out of one of those experiences of learning. This was when I was already teaching for the Jewish Theological Seminary. JTS connected me with a couple by the name of Didi and Steve Lovell. And we spent a year going through the different layers of the Haggadah. Why do I call it the archeology span of the Passover Haggadah? What image comes to mind when you hear archeology? span Ancient. Um, Ancient. Ancient, good. What else comes to mind? Levels. Levels, very good, levels. Another L word, layers, right? Levels and layers. And the point of saying archeology span of the Haggadah is that the Haggadah doesn't come to us in, from one period of Jewish history, but from multiple periods of Jewish history, biblical, rabbinic, medieval, and modern. And so I spent a year with Didi and Steve going through those different layers to understand how the Haggadah is woven together. At the end of that year, we were sitting at their kitchen table. Steve ran to his study to pull out the Passover Haggadah that the family had been using for God knows how many years. It was Mordechai Kaplan's new Haggadah published in the 1940s. Every single copy that the family had of this Haggadah was held together by electrical tape, <laughs> wine stains everywhere as there should be in a good Haggadah. And they began explaining to me that they wanted to create a tribute to the patriarchs of their family. Steve's father was born on Pesach in 1908 and Didi's father's Hebrew name was Pesach. So they felt that it would be appropriate to commission a new family, Haggadah. And they asked me, so what do you think of that, Matt? Taking that on as a project. So I was all excited about the prospects of working on a new Passover Haggadah. We sat down, we worked out an agreement that I would create a Haggadah that's substantive in Jewish art, new translation, and also egalitarian in approach with rich commentary, creative ideas to enrich the Seder. All of that in one year's time. And so I sat down, I began working on it, trying to do everything simultaneously. The artwork, the commentary, and the new translation. How far do you think I got? I found it to be overwhelming. And so I went back to Didi and Steve and I asked them, if we could work on this project in stages. And I said, the first stage that I wanna work on is the artwork. Could you give me the time to just immerse myself in the art and then we'll build it from there. Didi and Steve were very gracious. They said, absolutely. Four and a half years later, I finished the 27 pieces of art. It took another two and a half years to finish the commentary and the translation. But eventually, we did get to a trade edition of the Haggadah, right? This was the goal that we were aiming at. I'm going to pass this around so those in person can take a look. Uh, excuse me, when you say a trade edition, you mean one that is for commercial restoration? Exactly, exactly. By trade edition, I mean an edition of the Haggadah that everyone could use around their Seder table. Uh, it's the commercial edition of the Haggadah. So that, that is what we were passing around now. After four and a half years, I went to Israel to produce a limited edition of the 27 pieces of art. We created 250 sets of the 27 pieces of art. Uh, and that is what I am going to show to you now. Um, I'm gonna share screen. So when they commission it, does that mean yes. they get the original? Exactly, right. Uh, so they receive the original pieces of art. Okay, everyone out there on Zoom sees the art of freedom, the Lovell Haggadah on their screen. Just shake your heads or put your fingers up so I know you say, great, okay, fantastic. Uh, so yes, uh, they receive the original pieces of art. They have the entire collection. Uh, and it was, um, it was a remarkable partnership between uh, myself and, and the Lovell family. Oh, okay. Um, 
Okay, let's Excuse move me. this ahead. How, how big were each? Each of, each of the pieces is approximately the size that I'm going to show you. Um, the, the truth is that um, you can't tell the difference, the difference between the original and the prints that we made. It's quite remarkable. This is where we need to go, yes. Okay, that's what you're showing. Okay, now. That's what you're seeing. There we are. Okay, and there are Didi and Steve immediately after the first copy of the Passover Haggadah came out. Okay, let's turn to the first piece when you enter the land. Okay, those of you who are here in person, okay, this opening piece is a paper cut. Of course. Okay, I want to show, I'm going to put it against a white background so you can see the intricacies of this paper cut. Yep. Okay, this paper cut that you see on the screen is inspired by Parshat Kitavo, Deuteronomy 26, right? The Torah reading, which literally means when you come into the land of Israel. Why did I want to begin my Passover Haggadah at that point, at Deuteronomy 26? Anyone have any idea why I would want to begin my Haggadah with that as the inspiration? Well, that was the goal. That's coming out of uh, Egypt was to get to Israel. That's very good. That that is the goal coming into the promised land, certainly. And I've got plenty more to say about that. That's towards the end. That's very close to the end. And it, yes. And in addition, the other reason that I chose Deuteronomy 26 is because right at the beginning of that parsha, Kitavo, it talks about the mitzvah of Havaat Bikurim, the bringing of the first fruits. Once the Israelites are in the land, they're commanded to bring a basket of their first fruits, which are taken from the seven species, Shivat Aminim, seven species of the land of Israel. What are Shivat Aminim? Give, throw out some examples. Uh, they, pomegranate, wheat, barley, pomegranate, date, figs, grapes. Amazing. Okay. She knows. Fantastic. <laughs> Wheat, barley, pomegranate, dates, all of that, okay, all part of Shivat Haminim, all part of the, the seven species that the land of Israel is blessed with. So we are told to bring a basket of these fruits, set them by the altar, and when they're set down by the Kohen, by the priest, the Israelite recites, Arami Oved Avi Vayered Mitzrayma Vayagosham Ben Ma'at, my ancestor was a wandering Aramean. Went down to Egypt, few enough, this should sound familiar. We all know this from the Maxwell House. Right? <laughs> okay, from the Haggadah. When we get to the Magid section, telling the story, this is exactly the text that the rabbis base the, 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 the narrative on. Okay, that's what inspires the, the, Mag, the core section of the Passover Haggadah. And that's why I wanted to start here. And so if you look at this paper cut, you see the seven species of the land of Israel in the frame, sitting in the basket. There's a verse from Kitavo, that you shall bring of the first fruits that you shall take from the ground. The gazelles, because in Sefer Daniel, in the book of Daniel, Israel is called Eretz Hatzfi, the land of the gazelles which means it's a, a, a euphemism that Israel is a very beautiful land, and indeed it is. And the way this was designed was not only so that the paper cut would stand alone, but right, the second piece is a landscape that I painted based on a photograph taken in Mitzpah in Northern Israel. The idea is that this paper cut that you see here becomes a doorway or a gateway into the land of Israel. And so the two pieces are layered. Okay. There we go. Uh -huh. Okay, everyone in person, I just want you to take a close look at this. It's wow. really, really is. It's not decent. Okay, you can see the intricacies of the paper cut work too. It's like really paper cutting, you need a whole lot of patience, yeah. time. 
You make one mistake, you can't take some scotch tape and fix it, right? You got to start all over. Did you use an exacto knife? Exacto knife, archival quality paper, exacto knife. I drafted it out in pencil first and then, and then cutting, okay? And then of course, for the addition, what they did is they made a laser template from the original piece to make the 250 pieces. What's the media for the painting? So everything that you see here was originally done in uh, European gouache. Gouache is opaque watercolors, right? Very, very vibrant colors. The colors literally dance off the page. And then you'll see a uh, somewhat heavy use of gold leaf as well. One of the reasons that I wove gold leaf into what I do, actually, it's a perfect segue into the next piece that I'm about to show you. Where, where, where is the artist's name in there? Where's the artist's name? The artist's name, if you look at the original pieces or at the prints, uh, the artist signed right at the bottom. Oh, okay. okay. So there's the artist's name. You're not gonna see it there's nothing paper. hidden in the artwork, the cutout, the paper cut. No, 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 it's not, no, it is not hidden in the paper cut. Okay, so uh, you see the design for what I call the order of the Seder. In, in this PowerPoint presentation, but what you're missing here, those of you on Zoom, is the brilliance of the gold leaf. Those of you here in person, take a look at the gold, okay? Okay, the gold pops, okay? This is 23 and a half karat gold oh. leaf that's hand applied to the pieces. Why did I use gold leaves? Right, one of the blessings that I had of being employed by the Jewish Theological Seminary is when I began working on this project, I went to the rare book room of JTS, you right? Yeah, JTS sure. has the largest collection of rare Hebrew books and manuscripts in the Western hemisphere. It's the second largest collection in the world, right? First largest collection, the largest collection is at Hebrew University, Givat Ram. So when I began doing research for my Haggadah, I sat with a number of classical manuscript Haggadot, the librarian at the time, Jerry Schwartzbart, was kind enough to pull out a mountain of these Haggadot for me, right, so that I could study them in detail. And one of the things that I noticed immediately was this heavy use of gold leaf. Right? This is one of the reasons that pieces like this are called illuminations. Right? The idea is that the, the, the light bounces off of the gold and illuminates the eyes of the viewer. Okay, so what we see here in this piece, we have the steps of the Seder, Kadesh, Orchatz, Karpas, Yachatz, the telling of the story, the washing of the hands, right? Motsi Matzah, right? Maror, Korech, Shulchan Orech, Tzafun, Barech, Halel, Nirzah. Okay, it's woven. What do you see at the center of this illumination? Letters. Yes, you see the letters, Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, Hei, Vav. What do the letters represent? The days of creation. Excellent. Those, wait, just say it louder. The days of creation. Days of creation. These are the days of creation, right? Part of what inspired this was the Sarajevo Haggadah. Mm -hmm. Sarajevo Haggadah is a very, very famous Haggadah. The very beginning of that Haggadah has the days of creation, as if to say, right, that Yitziat Mitzrayim, that the exodus from Egypt was part of God's plan, right, from the moment of the creation of the world. So the reason that I wove the steps of the Seder into the days of creation, I wanted to say that Seder is not just about the hands-on ritual that we do around the table, but that it's woven into a deeper existential order, right? It's meant to remind us of this notion of Yetziat Mitzrayim being part of, uh, of creation. How different is this night from all of the nights? Manish Tana Halayla Hazer. Okay. Here, right, this is based on, right, the four questions. Okay. The history of the development of the four questions is, uh, is, is very, very interesting in the sense that in the original version of the four questions, what we discover is they're not questions at all. They're statements. The original text of the four questions is found in the 10th chapter 
of Masechet Psachim, Tractate Psachim. And what does it teach there? It says, Mazgulo Kosheni, pour the second cup of wine, Vechan Haben Shoel at Aviv. And here the child should ask questions. What does it mean here the child should ask questions? How would you interpret that? Give us the Rashi. Any questions that they have about Pesach. Thank you, Sheila. And Any question. Not, and because we are never able to say what the questions are, they have provided the four questions we should be asking. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so Sheila, you hit the nail on the head. The rabbi's intent, the kavana of the rabbis, was that children and adults sitting around the Seder table would ask questions spontaneously. Okay, whatever it is that comes to mind related to the theme of Yitziat Mitzrayim, related to the theme of the evening, right, our exodus from Egypt. What's so interesting is that the Mishnah goes on to say, Ve'im ein dat baben aviv milamdo. But if the child doesn't have enough knowledge or curiosity or understanding, then the parent should teach the child, Olin, which means not why is this night different from all other nights, just about every Haggadah translates it that way. But if you look at my translation of that page, okay, we're going to manish tana. Okay, so you look at my translation of the page, just look at it from a distance, what is missing on this page? Mark. Thank you. Not a single question mark on the page, right? Because I want it to be loyal to the original text. They're statements. They are not questions. One question and four statements, right? Okay. Not a single question. Why? Okay. The context, the, the way to translate is how different is this night from all their nights? Exclamation point. It's just like Matovu or Alecha Yaakov. How goodly are your tents, O Jacob, your tabernacles, O Israel. Okay, okay. exclamation point, right? It's the same syntax in the Hebrew. The very, Ma, very interesting. The Ma, that's a your question word, but not here. The, the Ma, in this case, is an exclamation. And it makes sense because if you're trying to spark curiosity in a child, what are you going to do? You're not going to ask another question, if the kid is, isn't willing to engage here yet, you're going to make observations of what's going on around the Seder table. You're gonna say in an animated sort of way, how different is this night from all their nights? On all their nights, we eat leaven or unleavened bread. On this night, only unleavened bread. On all their nights, we eat a whole variety of vegetables. On this night, maror, okay? Are there four? I, I have a question. Four exclamations instead of four questions. Uh, no, there's one. So the way I would do it is there is one exclamation at the beginning, and then the rest are statements. Okay. And the other piece that I want to point the rest out are statements through the whole Haggadah, or just, just those, those four statements right there. Manishtana halayla zemikol halelot exclamation point. Shebechol halelot anu ochlim hametsu matza halayla hazeh kulo matza. Period. Period. Okay, on all their nights we, okay? Shebechol halilot anu ochlin sha'ar yerachot halayla hazeh maror. Okay? So these these are all statements and I would put a period at the end of them. The other Matt, piece that's... I've got a, que I've got a question. Forward, Taylor, I assume, yes. I assume that there is a text next to this. That they're not really reading the artwork. Yes, exactly, exactly. Okay. Right, the, the artwork corresponds to the text, but the idea is that the artwork sparks conversation as well, right? That the artwork is meant to act as visual midrash. That's what's going on with the artwork. Now, yes. And right smack in the middle of this. Yes, is, thank you. Is, I'm so happy you're going there. Is, is Haggad, yo, is the goat. Is Haggad, yeah. Okay. okay. Is, is right, is the goat or the lamb, okay? And why did I do that? I did that because in the original version, there's a statement there that doesn't appear in our version of the Haggadah. What does it say? Shebechol anu ochlim 
בשר צלי שלוק ומבושל, הלילה הזה כולו צלי. On all their nights we roasted, boiled, or cooked meat. On this night, only roasted meat. So why did we have that particular statement? What is that connected to? Well, the Paschal lamb, you're, you're supposed, that's- The Paschal lamb. Exactly, the pa exactly, the Paschal lamb. Because that was the core observance of Passover according to Torah. Yeah. It was taking the lamb, it was roasting the lamb, And having the shawarma barbecue, that's, that's what Torah mandated. But then once the temple is, de is destroyed in 70 CE, we can no longer offer the Paschal lamb. What the rabbis did in the Mishnah was they wanted to preserve the memory of that ritual. Okay, so what, what ends up happening in our Haggadah? They pull that out because that's completely irrelevant today since... We're not eating lamb at the Seder table, at least roasted lamb we shouldn't be eating because we don't want it to look as if we sacrificed a lamb in our backyard. And instead, the rabbis put in the statement, שבכל הלילות אנו אוכלים בין יושבין ובין מסובין, הלילה הזה כולנו מסובין. And all the nights we eat either sitting or reclining, on this night, reclining. Now, what it, we're not supposed to eat roasted meat on Pesach, or we... That's, that's right, we Sheila. <laughs> yeah, I know you was one thing we're not supposed to do. Yeah, you, you shouldn't eat dry, dry roasted meat. What's interesting is that many in the Syrian Jewish community and also the Italian Jewish community do have roasted lamb on Pesach. Right? They consider themselves to be very, very ancient Jewish communities, and they have continued with this tradition. Right, but the rabbis actually, they, they uh, over the many years, forbid the eating of dry roasted meat because they didn't, marit ayin, how it looks to the eye. They didn't want people to think that you sacrificed a lamb outside of the precincts of the temple. Does There, the that's why we have chicken and turkey. <laughs> But Rabbi? Rabbi? Some people do have lamb, just so long as you cook it in a marinade, it's fine. Yes. Rabbi, oh. am I, on my father's side, which there's another connection I won't go to, but they, they had a custom that the lunch before was always lamb. Oh, interesting. Very, very interesting. And that's my duker side. I love it. It's part of... What I so enjoy about teaching on these illuminations, hearing what right, your family traditions are um, and how they're woven into your, your Seder observant. So, yeah. Is the um, lamb, the significance of the lamb, does it have something to do with the, uh, the main significance of the holiday, Pesach, and why we call it Pesach? Because we used what, a lamb's blood to put over the doorpost? And that's where Pesach name actually comes over the path over. Right. So it's a very, very interesting question. The question of what does Pesach mean? And if you take a close look at how Pesach is used throughout Tanakh, as in Pesach Al, okay, it actually, it doesn't mean Passover. That's actually a Christian interpretation. Okay. But Pesach Al means to defend. Okay, so what did God do, right? The, when it was that we were leaving, God defended the homes of the Israelites, right, from the destroyer, right, right, from the angel of death. Okay, that is what God did. It wasn't that God was like a rabbit hopping over, okay, but rather, and then how did we symbolize that? We symbolized it through the blood of the Paschal Lamb. Right? It became an apotropaic symbol, right? To put that blood on your mezuzah, it connects beautifully because later on I'm going to go to mezuzot. Okay, you would put that on your doorposts and that would be a symbol that God needed to defend that home. Now I want to turn to, right, the beginning of our storytelling. Okay, and this is my Avadim Hayinu piece. We were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. And to really understand this, you have to start upside down. What do you see? Try to visually, try to turn it right side up. What do you see at the bottom? 
Pyramid. Good. You yeah. see the you see the pyramid. What's on the pyramid? Bricks and uh, flowing water. What? What's uh, okay? Interesting. Isn't uh, a tree of life? Okay, there's a tree of life on the other side. Yeah. Okay, in front of the mountain, but at the bottom we have the pyramid, and draped over the pyramid is. Is it the splitting yes, of the yes, sea? Yes. Wait, say it louder. The coat of many colors that belong to Joseph. Why did I do this? That's why they were in the there is a there is a very beautiful midrash that says that the reason that we sing Avadim Hayinu at the Seder every year is to atone for the sin of selling our brother Joseph into slavery. God turned to the Israelites and said that you are going to atone for the sin of selling your brother into enslavement by reminding yourselves that you too were slaves in Egypt. So I took the pyramid, the Ketonet Pasim of Yosef, his Technicolor dream coat draped on the pyramid. And if you look around the pyramid, you see shackles of slavery. The shackles become the roots of a tree of life in Eitz Chaim that's growing in front of Har Sinai, in front of Mount Sinai. And at the top, a quote from the book of Ayikra from Leviticus, the children of Israel belong to me. They are my servants. I took them out of the land of Egypt. So this illumination tells the story of transitioning from being servants of Pharaoh to becoming servants of God. Is there any significance to? No, no. <laughs> we were just asking about a graphic element that appears, and um, I should probably say it's like God, Torah, and Israel, or um, I, I don't have a good explanation. It's just simply a graphic element that we used at various points. Um, this illumination, welcome, welcome. This illumination is connected to the B'nai Brak episode, right? When the rabbis were seated in B'nai Brak, telling the story of Yetziat Mitzrayim, the Exodus, right, all night until the students come in and say, Higia, man kriyat shel shacharit. Yeah. Right, the yeah. time has come for the recitation of the morning Shema. So what I did here is all of the iconography that you see here is connected to when it is that we can begin reading the morning Shema. Okay, so um, this is a very, very vivid piece. Uh, the first definition that we're given, the top left, Arba Amot, yeah. only when you could see your fellow human being a distance of four arms lengths from you, can you then begin your recitation of the Shema. In other words, you have to see the image of God in your fellow human being before you can declare God's oneness, God's uniqueness. The Tchelet, the snail, right, that gives the blue dye, Right, that's the origin of the blue dye that appears in the tzitziot, right, the ritual fringes. And then the rabbis talk about the, the, the variations of tchelet, uh, and that's what's symbolized by uh, the bottom boxes that we see there, the psychedelic tzitziot that you see dancing on the right side. Okay, the four children. What I did for the four children is I chose a biblical character to represent each of the four children. You have Devorah, the prophetess, as the wise child. King Achav from the Book of Kings is the wicked. Lot is the Tom, the simple, and Adam and Eve are the ones who don't know how to ask. I'm going to share a secret with you about this piece. This was not my original rendering of the four children. In my original piece... Sure. In my original piece, there's my original piece. Yeah, I'm gonna show, it. I'll bring this closer so you can all see it. Mm -hmm. It's not mm -hmm. Okay, so in my original piece, okay, which you see on screen here, I had Jonah as the wicked child. Yeah. And I had Noah as the Tom, the simple. Yeah. When I showed this piece to Didi and Steve, whose shining faces you saw at the beginning of this presentation, right, they were visibly upset with me. Their faces fell to the ground. What did I do wrong? 
named Jonah either. Did uh, they have a child named Jonah? Ah, uh, now we're getting closer. Worse than having a child named Jonah. Grandchild. There you go, grandchild. Two grandchildren living in Minneapolis. And guess what their names are? Jonah. Jonah, Jonah and Noah. Noah. It was a home run. Yeah. I had no clue. I spent months working on this. I had oh. deep philosophical reasons that I wanted to use Jonah and Noah. I did everything. I said they're biblical characters. They have nothing to do with your grandchildren. And then Steve started chuckling. He said to me, Matt, the real problem is the labels fit. And that they can't have the grandchildren <laughs> opening up the family Haggadah and seeing themselves like this. So I had to go back to the drawing board. The truth what is- What did you do with this picture? Uh, so I have the original. I, I have the original of this. Do you uh, think that the kids will at some point ever know about this? It would uh, be yes, no, the, kid, the kids do know about it. And we all laugh about it now. All of us laugh about it. Um, I mean, they, they don't know that, you know, their grandfather said the problem is that the labels fit. Um, but, you know, to be, to be fair, to be fair, I don't translate Rasha as wicked in the case of the four children. I, I translate Rasha as the wayward child, right? Or, or it could be the rebellious child. But it's a child who likes to push the boundaries. Right? I don't believe that that is a bad thing, pushing the boundaries, right? Because it's challenging all of us to think out of the box. You know, and one of the word, challenging. Right. One of the reasons that I, I like Jonah as, as the wayward child is because you have to think in a nuanced way about why it is. He was. Right, yes. Okay. He pushed back and protested. Right, and exactly. Okay, and ultimately, uh, Jonah's, Jonah's real problem is that he can't get out of his own shoes. Right, he's not willing to see the world from another perspective, right? In, in the case of the book of Jonah, from God's perspective, when God wants Jonah to save the Ninevites, right? Jonah wants, to, wants nothing to do with it. He refuses to expand himself to be a more compassionate human being. And that's part of the reason that I wanted to use, uh, to, you know, to use Jonah here. Oh, and there's Jonah and Noah. Right. I mean, they're in their 20s now, these kids, uh, this beautiful, beautiful family from Minneapolis. And that's Dee Dee and Steve's daughter. That's uh, when Wendy Lavelle Smith. And she stood by us. OK, this is the second of three paper cuts that appear in the portfolio. Uh, for those of you who are here in person, you get the treat of seeing the actual paper cut. Again, I'll walk this around. Wow. This is astonishing. Right. Astonishing. Right. He, stood, he stood by us. So the question the commentators wrestle with is who or what stands by us in every generation? Right. Is it God? Is it Torah? Is it God's promise? What I did here is I illustrated three very yeah. difficult episodes. In, in, Israel, in Israelite history. Yes. Do so you do the painting and then the cutting, or the cutting and then the painting? I did. I um, in this case, I did the cutting and then the painting. I did the cutting and then. The painting. What kind of paper is this that you're cutting? Um, this paper is called Arsh, right? The original the original cuts that I did were on archival quality paper. Oh. So it um, you know, but it, it's if you feel. The, right? the weight of Me? this paper, of course, yes, yeah. Right. So yeah. that 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 gives you a sense. So it has to be, you know, a thicker paper. Yeah. Right. So what you have here is uh, the top left-hand corner: Jacob in the house of, of Lavan with Rachel and Leah. Top right-hand corner: Amalek, the quintessential enemy of the Israelites. Bottom left-hand corner, there's Ahasuerus with Esther gazing at the news of Haman. And bottom right-hand corner, right, so exactly. Okay, so you have survivors of the Shoah peering over the barbed wire. And if you look closely again at the paper cut in gold leaf, you see Hatikva, right? So, oh, yeah. right, so hope, 
Right, there it is in gold leaf. Oh, yeah. Right, again, I was wrestling with Cora, yeah. what is, is it that stands by us in every generation? I see the gold leaf there. Uh, oh, okay. It's like yeah. Oh, I see it. Yeah. Is it? I see the hay. Like, it says all the animals. I see the hay. I don't see the two letters. Here. K. Oh, gotcha. Kupa. There you go. And those of you who are with us on Zoom, if you're here over Shabbat, grab me, and I'm happy to show you these pieces in person. Rabbi, the upper right again? The upper right is Amalek, right? The quintessential enemy of the Israelites who attacks, Amalek attacks the Israelites, right? The, the stragglers as they're coming out of Egypt. And then he becomes a symbol of those who try to destroy us in every generation. Maror, the subtle descent. Okay, what I did here is, um, right, this is very much inspired by a menu that we are given in the Shulchan Aruch, right? The quintessential code of Jewish law tells us that there are many different varieties of things that we can use for maror. What do we always use for maror typically? Horseradish, right? We always use horseradish root, right? We grind horseradish or we use gold's horseradish. Okay, but in fact, the rabbis say that the best thing to use for maror is not horseradish, horseradish root, right? But it's romaine lettuce. And why romaine lettuce? Because at first it's sweet to the palate. And then as you chew it, the longer you chew it, the more bitter it becomes. The idea is that it reflects the experience of the Israelites in Egypt. When they first go down to Egypt, sweet. it's a very sweet experience. Joseph and his brothers, right? And they're prosperous, they're prolific. And then what happens? Yeah. A new king arises over Egypt that doesn't know Joseph. And then the enslavement begins gradually. It happens slowly. In other words, what I want to express here is that slavery does not happen overnight for the Israelites. It's not this dramatic change in their status. But it happens so slowly, they don't even recognize that it's happening. One of my favorite Jewish books, one of my favorite Jewish history books, is Amos Elon's The Pity of It All in which he tells the story of the Jews of Germany up until the Holocaust. If you haven't read this book, order it on Amazon tomorrow and read the book. You will read it cover to cover. It is an, it it is an unbelievably nuanced, and, and it's the same story. It shows you how the German Jews literally did not see it coming, that it happened so slowly, so, so gradually. So what I did here is I calligraphed the first chapter of the book of Exodus, right, transitions from light blue to dark blue. And then you've got the romaine lettuce. And in that romaine lettuce, right, that gradual story of enslavement, you get to the bottom, finally, of Dut, right, the hard slavery of Egypt. And we cried out. What was the name of the book? Again? The, uh, Amos Elon, the pity of it all. The pity of it all. Amos Elon, E-L-O-N. Okay, this is the third and final paper cut, and this is, the, midrashically, this is my favorite paper cut. Okay, I'm gonna walk this around so you can all take a look at this. What I did here is I went back to the vidui, back to the confessional that the Israelite says when the first fruits are presented. The whole Arameo Vedavi business. My ancestor was a wandering Aramean. As part of that declaration, the Israelite says, we cried out to the Lord our God. So what I did here is you see that expression vanitzak repeated numerous times. Every time you see vanitzak, it's stylistically unique because I wanted to give the sense of multiple Israelite communities crying out in their own unique voices. The cry ascends heavenward. And then at the center of this paper cut, you see vayishma, Okay, this is a quote from the end of the second chapter of Shmot, of Exodus. Vayishma, God heard their cry, 
Vayiskor, God remembered the covenant. Vayar, God saw their affliction. Vayeda, God knew. And that's when Yitziat Mitzrayim begins. That's when God enters history to take the Israelites out of Egypt. So what else do I want to say about this? Here's what I want to say. You said four things, though, again. The theme of four, right? Vayishma, Vayiskor, Vayar, Vayeda. Beautiful. Right. Yes. Beautiful. Okay. Who is the hero of the Passover story that we would expect to hear a whole lot about in the Haggadah? Moses. Say it or not. Moses. We don't hear it. How many times does Moses appear in, in the traditional story? One the traditional times. once. And I challenge you to find it. Find he's the one. He's not mentioned. He's mentioned uh, Derek Agav. You know, it's just they refer to exactly. Right. Sort of by the way, he's yes. Okay. Now, why is that? It's because the rabbis wanted to accentuate yeah, the role of God in our redemption. We wanted to say that it was God who redeemed us. Okay. okay. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Very, Very differently from the energy because this is the against rabbi. Man man right. To redeem. Yeah. Right. We're saying it's God. Okay. So I know the one here. here's, here's the wonderful piece that completes the story. Apropos of Israel's 75th anniversary, when the Chalutzim, the pioneers, came back to build this miraculous country of Israel, right, they created their own Haggadot on the early Kibbutzim. Who is the character that the Kibbutzniks left out of the Haggadah? God. God. They left God out. Why? Because, because they were from the common, they were the lefties and they didn't believe it. Yes, God. they were certainly the lefties, they didn't believe it, and they felt very, very strongly that we could not wait for divine redemption anymore. That redemption had to come through human hands, it had to come from us. So, what I want to say to you tonight is that the rabbis got it wrong, it's not only God and it's not only humans, and the kibbutzniks got it wrong. And what I love, it, what, I tr what I wanted to do here midrashically is say that it's covenantal partnership, right? Because we take the first step to cry out. Um, and this, I, I need to credit Emil Fackenheim of blessed memory. He was a professor of Jewish philosophy at University of Toronto. He's the one who points out that it's actually the people, the Israelites, and that's the shot of the text. That's the literal understanding of the Exodus story that Torah gives us that the people cry out to God. And because the people cry out, God yes. extends like, his arms in redemption, which I think is a very, very beautiful notion. So I'm going to flip through. Um, I, you know, I see that you know, we're running through time here. And I want to get to um, a couple of other things. So right, the plagues. R Rabbi? Yes. Um it may not be something you want to discuss, but if it's okay, um, you, when this came out for a few years, you were quoted about being inspired by the life and one of them happened to be a close relative of mine. Um, is oh, there anything you might be willing to say about how- uh, Do I have a Duker or an Eisenfeld here? You have a Duker. I got a Duker, amazing. Um, and so I wondered, I know time is running out, but I thought you might be, I don't know, I was, it, it's life is always bittersweet. And I can't tell you most of her life, I, I had Seder with her. I just tell wanted me. to, wanted tell to me hear your name. about a Jonina, which is why so I would defend Jonah Duker. <laughs> it's wonderful to meet you virtually, Jonina, and I hope uh, I hope I'll get to meet you in person over Shabbat. No, um, I'm in Maryland. I'm home. Oh, you're in Maryland. Okay. In Maryland. Okay. So I'll just say very, very quickly when when I was a rabbinical student, my year in Israel, uh, studying at the Schechter Institute as part of my JTS studies, uh, my roommate and his almost fiance were killed in a terrorist attack. Matthew Eisenfeld of Blessed Memory and Sarah Duker of Blessed Memory. Sarah, I first studied with when I was at Pardes before rabbinical school. I had the great privilege of getting to know Sarah. 
She was this um, colorful, remarkable, brilliant. At that point, she was an undergraduate at Barnard College, um, spectacular human being, and, and so was Matt. They were two of the most exceptional uh, human beings in this world. Uh, and um, I have plenty to say uh, uh, about the two of them and actually did a lot of talking about the two of them this past Yom HaZikaron, only a couple of weeks ago. I shared memories of them with my rabbinical and cantorial students in Israel. Uh, and I feel that everywhere I walk in Jerusalem, I think of the two of them. They were uh, two absolutely remarkable human beings. Sarah was very much devoted to environmental studies um, and deeply immersed in, in Jewish studies and passionate about her Judaism. Um, and so was Matt. Matt uh, was a graduate of Yale uh, and was actually preparing for his parents' uh, visit. They were going to be there for Pesach. So he was putting together a Haggadah. So as I was working on this, in so many ways, it was a tribute to the two of them. And I had the privilege of sharing this with Lenny and Vicki Eisenfeld, and of course, Arlene Duker, um, uh, all three of whom I, I, I love dearly. So I feel like every page of this Haggadah, in so many ways, I see the reflection of, uh, of, of the two of them. Um, th thank you, Janina. The teaching of Rabban Gamliel. I'm just going to go through these uh, very quickly. Miriam the prophetess, Miriam dancing with 36 women, right? I was basing it off of the teaching of the Lamed Vavnikim, Septer the Lamed Vavnikot. In every generation, there are 36 righteous people that sustain the world. Next year in Jerusalem, the story of Choni Amagel, Choni the circle drawer, and then the songs of Pesach. Oh, nice. That was the Chad Miodea that you saw before. And finally, I wanted my Haggadah to end with the singing of Atikva, right? And there it is, right? I wanted to bring it up to present day. I'm going to stop sharing, okay? I am going to um, say that my Haggadah is available for purchase. Those of you who are here in uh, the B'nai Shurin community, you're welcome to order uh, this Haggadah. I'm gonna send um, uh, boxes. I will sign personalized copies. Uh, there'll be information sitting out here for you to organize. You can also write to me at rabbimattberkowitz at gmail.com. rabbimattberkowitz at gmail.com. And you could be part uh, of that order as well. $50 either for the trade edition or for uh, the gift edition of, of the Haggadah. So, those are the Haggadot. And um, before we end... The analysis of the pictures and what we put into them. Yes, the it, is, it is in this edition of the Haggadah, the Lovell Haggadah. Okay, there's an appendix that goes through the various layers of, of the art. This is hot off the press. This is a set of mezuzot that I created based on a teaching from the Gemara, a teaching from the Talmud. It's like Chad Gadya, follow this. Okay. The rabbis teach there are 10 resilient things in the world, 10 which actually become 12. Mountains are strong, but iron cuts through mountains. Iron is strong, but fire cuts through iron. Fire is strong, but it's extinguished by water. Water is strong, but it turns into mist. Mist is strong, but it's dispersed by the wind. Wind is strong, but it's inhaled by humans. Humans are strong, but they're weakened by fear. Fear is strong, but wine conquers fear. Wine is strong, but sleep takes care of the effects of wine. Sleep is strong, but death conquers sleep. And what's strongest of all? Tzedakah tatsiyomi mavet. Charity or righteousness saves from, from death. So each of these individual mezuzah, and then together they tell the story. And finally, as we wrap up, I'll show you the tzedakah box version of that. <laughs> there it is. Oh, okay. oh, oh nice. Yeah.
I'll pass it around so you can take it. I can get on and show other people. Um, Rabbi Foster, I know we have to wrap up. Um, or do we yeah, we do need to wrap up in a okay. minute. Okay. Another session. Um, I'm happy to take a question or two about some of the artwork that you've seen. What, what, do, you, what do you do in your artwork? And how? And do you commit a certain amount of time or do you become spontaneous? Uh, do you have other duties that you do? Are you a rabbi in a congregation? I don't know. Okay, so uh, in Jerusalem, I've been serving as the Jewish Theological Seminary's Director of Israel Programs, working with rabbinical and cantorial students. And in addition, I'm one of the founders of the studio project in Jerusalem's Artist Lane called Kolaot. I encourage you to go to the website, take a look at what we do at Kolaot. I spend two full days a week in the studio uh, doing my art um, and also doing you know, the organizational work. Um, what we do at Kolaot is we weave Jewish history, texts, and values into the arts. Uh, visual arts and also performing arts. It's an amazing space. We work with synagogue groups, federation groups, day school groups that are coming to Israel. Uh, and uh, we use the arts as a way of processing the Israel experience. Uh, my next big project when I go back is working on, I've got a big ketubah commission that I need to do. Uh, Kituba typically take me six to eight weeks to do. Uh, the calligraphy, the artwork, um, and then I'm trying to think of my next big project here, what it is that I want to be doing. Any other questions? Okay. Again, if you're interested in ordering the Haggadah, Rabbi Matt Berkowitz, Matt with two T's at Gmail. You could also go to my website, rabbimattberkowitz.com and um, see more of my artwork there. Thank you so much for being a part of this, Rabbi Foster. I'll hand it off to you. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you, Yasha Koa. See you tomorrow. Thank to you. Yes, we encourage everyone else to join throughout the weekend. Rabbi Berkowitz is teaching uh, uh, Friday night, I think, during for those who signed up for the Shabbat dinner and on Shabbat morning, with the installation as well, and on Sunday morning, a session here. Um, so excited to have you with us. And we'll, we'll take a minute to switch over, and Rabbi Bruce is going to be teaching. Uh, he's going to be coming in here in, in just a minute as well. So if you want, I know you're taking, if anyone is leaving, let's see the art here, but we'll, we'll flip over in a minute uh, for Rabbi Bruce's class. Uh, yeah, thank you. I'll give you a peek at mm -hmm. This is a paper cut that I did. Somebody on the phone can get out. It's a wedding it's gift or an anniversary gift. Um, it has both Moroccan and Afghan influences. Yeah. What's the chance? It was sent out. But some people, it's easier. This is to, a paper cut? It, it was sent out. Oh, I, mean, yeah. I, I call it Moroccan it, I it's, and it's, it's not my it's note, like a wedding gift here. or an anniversary gift. Like the, the, the quote there is from <laughs> Cher Shalou, right, from <laughs> The Song of Songs. Okay. Okay. Oh, it's it's a, we'll need to switch. Yeah. 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 Yeah.